it comes to Lewis uh, being the new um, submission, guest submission in today's uh, Twitter submission, inquiry. Um, in a particular way, but um, just introducing it here first to those who may not know who I am. I'm Lila Namsanga. I'm a panelist in this inquiry. We have been explaining it throughout the week that uh, the chairperson of the inquiry has not been ready to attend due to circumstances beyond his control or the company's control. And I've, um, I'll be trailing the way um, as I will run in at least on Monday. I would like to, uh, I'm also here as a co-pilot, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Thereafter, I'll ask uh, the, the Lewis delegation to also introduce themselves on the record, especially the people who may not be able to attend. But I'm happy for everyone to contribute themselves, even if they're, they're not here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lila Msango. I'm also a deputy panelist in this submission, leading the Twitter team to take the lead in today's inquiry. Good afternoon, my name is Kayo Kumalo. I'm the senior editor of Twitter for Lewis Magazine. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Spencer Son. I'm the managing director for the Lewis Food Division. Good morning, I'm Antoine Kovalier, uh, regional director for Lewis Magazine. from Weber Wenzel, representing Woolworths. Thank you. Um, uh, we, different stakeholders, um, especially the, the, your ret uh, the retailers um, to whom the inquiry is written to, had different ways of um, uh, 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 presenting. Others had introductory remarks. I don't know if, if, if how you uh, intend to proceed. Um, we, uh, we are in your hands, or, or maybe if you want us to just go into, uh, just I'll start by asking you questions. I don't know how you want to proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, my clients will um, make a presentation to the panel. We've prepared um, a short PowerPoint presentation just by way of talking points, which um, is presented. I do have some extra copies if you that I could possibly hand up and that might guide you if you want to make notes on it. But I will ask um, Mr. Son and Mr. Pavilius to, um, to, to take you through the presentation. <coughs> Okay, thanks very much uh, to the Commission for allowing us the opportunity again to, uh, to make the submission. Um, really the structure of our presentation is to give everybody just an overview of the business um, and we start to delve quite deeply into our foods division but I think it's important to understand the context of our broader organization, how foods fits into that and then some of the sort of key aspects um, of our business uh, with specific re uh, reference to the, the kinds of um, topics that I think the inquiry is focused on. So let's see if technology plays. of the presentation, uh, we'll cover the group into foods, our distribution and cold chain, talk about our stores, uh, store openings and leases. Um, from a group perspective, uh, the, so the Woolworths Holdings Group is, uh, is a Southern Hemisphere retail group. It uh, um, 
is comprised of three operating divisions. Uh, Woolworths South Africa, which is uh, head office in Cape Town and specifically trades within South Africa and other parts of Africa. Um, it is a, just under 60% of the group turnover and just over 65% of the group uh, profit. Uh, within that, because it's relevant to our foods business, uh, foods is about 67% of the Woolworths South African business from a turnover perspective. Um, the second division is David Jones, which is uh, head office in Sydney currently and trades in Australia and New Zealand. And then Country Road, which is based in Melbourne and trades in Australia and New Zealand and has some standalone stores in South Africa um, as well as has a footprint within our stores in South Africa. Um, of note is as a group, it is, our, it is our group vision to be one of the most responsible retailers in the world. We have eight key uh, sustainability focuses uh, in that regard. We employ a, a, across the group about 44 and a half thousand employees. We have uh, 1,500 stores across the 14 countries within which we trade and we serve about 15 million customers across the southern hemisphere. So drilling down into foods, um, our main target market is in old speak, the LSM 8 to 10 and now SEL 1 to 2. So we're very focused and have been consistently uh, for many years within the food division on the sort of upper middle to upper end of the market. <coughs> our main competitors uh, being Checkers, Pick and Pay, Spa. 90% um, of the products we sell, uh, so just to be clear about what that slide says, it's not 90% not of our catalog, but 90% of the products we sell are always branded. Uh, if you look at our sales, and we have a very uh, <coughs> diverse supplier base, so comprised of large and small. Um, we have a number of branded multinationals that supply into our business as well. Um, and then we have uh, a number of private uh, and some family-owned independent businesses that, that supply us, and we'll talk more about our suppliers as we go through. Um, just by way of uh, our evolution as a business, uh, the business was founded in 1931, we were a general retailer. Foods was a very small part of that business. Um, and ironically, we only s exclusively sold branded items back then. Um, always offering more premium quality innovative products. Uh, in the 60s, uh, we started to see a fundamental change in the retail landscape. Uh, larger retailers, the likes of Pick and Pay, the likes of OK Bazaars, started to, with real scale, introduce uh, far more competitive pricing on branded products which um, we struggled to compete with and consequently lost market share. Um, it was also strategically quite a tipping point for our business uh, and a tipping point for the direction that our business was then to take, which has continued to this day, which was to really embark on a strategy of differentiation. We couldn't compete with the bigger players uh, at that time and so sought to find our niche uh, within the market through differentiating ourselves. Um, and we set about differentiating ourselves through our product, <coughs> and that fundamentally gave birth to, to our private label or Woolworths brand strategy. Um, it's a strategy we've remained true to to this day, um, and it meant in about 1963 a deviation from um, a predominantly branded environment. In fact, we moved all brands out of our store, started to build our own quality, um, and consistently delivering uh, the best quality permeates right throughout our business, um, not only on our fresh food side, it permeates into the ambient side of our business and permeates through the way we serve up the people we have. It's a, it's a real philosophy within our business. And that strategic change started to show its backup area through, um, through this model that allowed us to get goods to stores just in time um, and replenish them frequently uh, and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. um, it's also important to say that at that time we saw the opportunity to um, roll out more conveniently located stores, so it's a bullet point slightly lower down on the, on, on, on the slide, um, but from a chronological point of view was around the same time um, where we went into um, slightly smaller locations in residential areas and we have over the years developed the capability to run them fairly profitably. Um, they're obviously expensive to set up and, and can be expensive to run 
uh, you over-indexing fresh in, 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 in those environments, which was our strength and it was where we wanted to differentiate our, ourselves. Um, and so our supply chain, our uh, systems, both forecasting and replenishment, our store processes uh, all needed to be honed in order for us to manage those um, environments uh, well and profitably. Um, and I think it helped us uh, deliver this high ground in, in fresh, convenient, um, high quality food. In 2000, we started to think about expanding our offer. At that time, customers still cherry picked us for their favorite Woolies items and we weren't seen as a one-stop shop. And we never want to be seen as a one-stop shop for the mass market, but we did want to be uh, more appealing and have a higher penetration for our target customer who was becoming more time starved want to offer them con the convenience of starting of being able to find everything that they wanted uh, in our larger stores and that resulted in us um, starting to bring um, more non-branded Woolworths products into our store again um, as but being very choiceful about which products we brought in uh, given the fact that the vast majority of our stores by uh, relative terms to our competitors are still fairly small um, given the fact that we wanted to over index on our private label we are very selective about which branded or non Woolworths items we bring into our stores in order to complement that overall proposition uh, obviously being guided by what our customers want um, and throughout we have continued to uh, invest significantly in our cold chain um, and equally whilst it's not a direct investment of our own Cold chain doesn't only start at the door of our distribution center, it starts all the way back into our manufacturing facilities. And so the investment into this uh, cold chain, um, real competitive uh, value that we have in our business starts all the way uh, back there. So that's just to give you a sense of the evolution, some of the barriers we faced coming into the market, how we needed to course direct, and I think quite importantly, how um, some of what happened back in the 60s uh, really started to solidify our strategy and our point of difference today. So if you are, you know, the, the Woolies difference is encapsulated in many, many things. Um, the difference is our strap line. Uh, and we've just tried to, you know, call out the, the key things. It's, it is all about our quality. Uh, Woolies is renowned and loved for innovation. Um, Customers trust us for safety. Over the years, we've been able to um, offer customers choice. Uh, we like to think that we're able to deliver that consistently, certainly not perfectly. Um, and the overall proposition we want to give to customers, because there's no doubt we're not the cheapest retailer in the marketplace, is value. And when you stack up everything that we offer, um, the, the one uh, element we haven't necessarily referenced there, but which is, which is really core to our capability, is the notion of convenience um, would all be wrapped up in in that difference and we seek to deliver this through uh, through the Woolworths brand um, ultimately that is what differentiates us and it's compelling as long as we able to deliver it and deliver it consistently now um, the, the manner I guess fundamentally that we're able to deliver that is through the product um, we can have the you know the best stores uh, best service but the, those elements really come to bear uh, when the customer uh, evaluates our product. Um, and so it highlights the, the real importance of those folk that make our products, which is our manufacturing base, um, our suppliers, because that is where the product comes from. And our success is totally, our success in, in being able to deliver the difference is, is totally reliant on that supplier base uh, that helps us to deliver that. And so. Over many, many years, we've built partnerships with our suppliers, um, and we believe that within our, within our supplier base, we, we have some of the highest quality producers, not necessarily always the biggest, but some of the highest quality producers um, and growers in the marketplace. And together, we've built businesses, some from really, really small. Um, many, many years ago, they would have been you know, uh, backyard or garage operations uh, into formidable businesses today. We um, have tried to play our part by providing the market, by remaining committed to those suppliers so that they could invest into their businesses. We've imparted um, skills, particularly on the product development side and technical side, into those suppliers. We've also been able to provide access into international manufacturers, 
what international plants look like and what some of the processes are in those facilities. Um, and our suppliers have been able to invest in, in the best technology and people. Um, and today we have partnerships that span, you know, 30 to 50 years uh, long. We even have a few suppliers that have crossed the 60-year the journey, multi-generational suppliers that have been with us, still built on exactly the same values um, that we started, started with. In trying to give you a very snapshot view of um, operationally how uh, our, our trading groups are structured, um, the key pillars of our business are, um, are centered around these sort of uh, core, core areas. So there's a buying capability that sits within our structure. You know, this is not going to be too f uh, unfamiliar from other businesses, but where we would over-index or under-index um, would be quite unique to us. So in any retail business, you've got to have buying, and they look after the commercial aspects of your business. Uh, planning, which looks after the um, really allocation of goods, forecasting, stock management, replenishment flow of stock into stores, cataloging, um, which are the right products for the right stores. Uh, new product developers, this would be an area where we always would over-index in terms of the in-house capability that we have. So we have a team of product developers um, who are pretty much all uh, you know, skilled and educated, some with a you know, chefing background, others with culinary school background, others homegrown talent uh, within our business, um, making up the, th the third component of our of our operating team, and then technologists, all of which are food scientists, so we'd have a food science uh, or um, a technical a, a diploma, a degree or qualification, and they really look after the quality and safety of our business. Um, and a lot of our success lies in the integration of this team um, and how they work together. They, they, there's a healthy tension that exists uh, because whilst each, whilst they work together really well as the team, each has a, has a specific agenda that they're driving, and our function is to be able to harness that so that the, it delivers the best, the best uh, product um, outcome. This would be, um, broadly speaking, what comprises each of our trading divisions. When I talk trading divisions, that rolls itself all the way down into a department. So the dairy department or the poultry department would have a buyer, planner, product developer, technologist. Sometimes when the departments are slightly smaller, you would have uh, some of those roles shared, uh, but generally all of those um, functions would come to bear within a department in driving that business forward. Um, within the food division, from a central point of view, they would also these trading teams would be supported by centers of excellence. So you would have a, a technical center of excellence and a new product center of excellence which uh, supports the trading group. They would generally have a far, far broader and far further um, horizon. They would look at you know, global trends and best practice, um, refine processes, uh, and provide training and upskilling that then finds its way into the, into the trading groups, which is more um, focused on the sort of day-to-day -day operational running of the business and as a sort of an 18-year of an 18, uh, sorry, an 18-month horizon. So we just wanted to give you a flavor of the makeup of what goes on in sort of the head office team. Um, a lot of the interaction with Woolies would obviously be um, in our stores. So that's the, that's the team that sits behind. Um, and I'm really honing in here on the food division. Obviously, we're supported by many other um, divisions, supply chain, IT, our real estate division, etc. The good business journey is something we, we're really proud of. It's in its 10th year this year. Um, we've been blessed to win a number of awards. Thrice we've won the most responsible retailer in the world award. Um, we monitor um, multiple things, you know, the control of our trucks, our electricity, water, all of the things we, we call out there. Um, we are focused on sustainable farming. We focus on sustainable sourcing. Um, our Farming for the Future program, which is highlighted in our stores and in our marketing activity, will be familiar to many of you. Um, within the sustainable sourcing, a good example is sourcing of sustainable palm oil. Um, we have an aspiration, for example, in 2020 to only use uh, responsibly sourced palm oil in the manufacture of any of our private label products. That's just an example of the, the kind of targets we've set ourselves in the space of sustainable sourcing. Um, and then we also sponsor the entry of new suppliers. We currently have 48 um, enterprise development suppliers working with Woolworths. In the past three years, 
the accumulated spend would be just on about a billion rand um, of our turnover um, or of the cost of turnover into us. Um, we've dispersed just on about 26 million rands worth of uh, funding to those suppliers. Um, it's a big focus for us, even more energized. We've, uh, we're looking for small, smaller, more artisanal suppliers. Um, we're looking for more black suppliers. We've set ourselves a target of improving, uh, increasing our percentage of black spend from where it is today to a quite um, bold target for 2020. So um, it's something we want to get after quite aggressively. Um, and it's something we're good at because throughout our Throughout our, um, our journey as Woolies, we have grown suppliers from being very small to now uh, being formidable, formidable businesses. Um, we have, you know, we own our own distribution centers. We um, have three of them, Mid the Midra and DC, um, up, up, up here, Cape Town a distribution center, and then uh, a smaller distribution center in, uh, in Durban. Um, there are a number of advantages to to the centralized distribution model. Many retailers are following that model now. We've been doing it, as I said, since the 80s. Um, it gives our suppliers w one or three um, access points to deliver to. It helps us control our quality better, um, rather than suppliers delivering to the back of every single store every single day. It allows them to make one delivery, and we, you know, we carry the cost in of, of untrunking those. Um, it does also allow us to have less storage space within our stores, and therefore we can we can give more of the of the space to the to the trading um, to the trading environment. Um, and then just cold chain is worth calling out. This really is the uh, the pride of our business, um, both infrastructurally in the way that we've um, geared ourselves uh, to maintain uh, our temperatures in in the fresh part of our business right throughout our chain. And as I made reference to earlier. Even back into our supplier base, the, the temperatures within, with, within which our, our factories operate, um, and then all the way into our stores. So certainly cold chain infrastructurally is really embedded into our business, but it's also embedded culturally. Um, it's, it's something which we've developed over many years. In our store staff are very clear, our distribution staff are very clear about the parameters within which they need to operate in order to make sure that we are safeguarding and looking after uh, that cold chain throughout our business, um, and yeah, ultimately it's about ensuring that we we maintain not only safe products, that we, but that we deliver the product to the customer um, in the most uh, delicious, um, highest level of quality uh, state uh, that we possibly can. And cold chain is a massive, massive enabler to unlock that. Um, but obviously, it uh, it looks after the safety of the product as well, and, and thereby protects our customers. I'm going to hand over to Maurice now to just run with the last couple of slides. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, I just want to take you a, a few slides just uh, through some uh, background information on the, ma the makeup of the real estate space. Uh, we've been, uh, we was, uh, as the business strategy is, is an LSM 8 to 10, our location of our stores is very much an LSM 8 to 10 location. It needs to be a premium destination and need to be a, an attractive uh, uh, destination. We currently trade on uh, 234,000 square meters, uh, both uh, across in South Africa and the rest, uh, rest of Africa, which is made up of about 330 markets. And if you split those markets uh, further, there's about a 46% of those markets trade with clothing, meaning they are located, uh, or just short of half of them, are located in, uh, in medium to large shopping centers that tra trades with, uh, with, uh, with, with clothing. If you compare it to our uh, competitors, I think uh, we estimate that we approximately one-tenth the size of, of the trading footprint of what a pick and pay and the checkers is. We're probably about one-fifth the size of what SPA is uh, uh, in terms of their space. <coughs> if we look where our spaces are located, 84% uh, of all our trading space is located in the four metropole, meaning Johannesburg, Pretoria, and Cape Town, Durban. So only 16% of the space is actually located in the country towns, in the smaller towns, which include Port Elizabeth, East London, and, 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 Bloom, and Bloemfontein. So we're primary uh, 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 the major city uh, trader, 
And if you unpack it then further, uh, as we spoke last, we're very much located in the high-end suburbs, meaning the east of Pretoria, north of Johannesburg, but in the south, the wealthier suburbs, the north of, uh, the north of Durban. Um, okay, thanks. If we look at where we open stores uh, and where do we find opportunities, uh, I think uh, the first question is where can we trade profitably uh, and where is the demographic makeup that matches our, 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 our target uh, of LSM uh, nine, primary nine, 9 to 10. Uh, and then one trying to determine the size of that trading opportunity. Uh, how much of that market can we, can we capture in terms of a market share calculation? Uh, normally, we already have a lot of stores in these markets. Uh, uh, and then uh, the key question for us is about cannibalization. How much is new sales and how much is existing sales? meaning whether we're just moving deck chairs uh, uh, or not. And I think if one understands that market, one can then get into the, the issues around the center and where it's located and how convenient <laughs> is it, uh, what does the center do to compete with other centers, uh, is this the most attractive center relative to the others, uh, what is the tenant mix, uh, and uh, et cetera. I mean, uh, that's normally the, the sequence in terms of how we would analyze a particular opportunity uh, going forward. If we look at our leases, I think, you know, our view is that we have no exclusivities in our leases. We have a fair amount of clauses that deal with <coughs> to capture the intent of the centre that's presented to us. So at the time of when we make the decision to, to go into a centre, the picture that's presented to us, the makeup of the tenants that's presented to us, and the purpose of the centre that's presented to us, we're trying to capture. So if it's a convenient centre, we would and we investing in a convenient center, we would like that that purpose of that center remain as that, that it doesn't change its colors halfway through its life and try to compete with a super regional, meaning bringing a lot of national fashion in and change the nature of it. Because I think <laughs> all shopping centers fulfill a specific purpose, whether it's convenience and whether it's pure destination in the sense of, of a Santon or a, a, mall of, uh, a Mall of Africa. And I think the rest of the, there's a fair amount of clauses about climb, crime and grime kind of issues, about cleanliness issues, about refuge yards, not within certain distances to our front door. And it's primary to, to control the environment that we trade in, that it, that it, uh, uh, and that it's of a, of a high standard for, uh, for our customers, and that it's complementary uh, to the kind of customer that we're trying to attract to that particular trading opportunity. I think uh, there was a fair amount of questions in the last discussion on, on return on investment and, and what is that period. Uh, we've done a fair amount of work on it, but there are so many parameters uh, around what makes uh, an investment pay off in a certain particular period. Uh, you know, whether to the size of the market, the wealth in the market, the frequency of shop, whether the landlord charges for parking, uh, or not, or uh, how many stores we have in terms of cannibalization or competing schemes coming up and cannibalized that will all impact on the growth. The, the quantum of capital that we invest in there, the kind of rental deal that we do, uh, etc., all has a function in terms of whether that payback period is, is, is medium or long term or can drift out, or you can enter into economic environment as we have at the moment where the growth rates are far softer, and then that payback period will, will ultimately just move further further out. And I think that's really the key highlights that we want to do, deal with in the, in the upfront uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, in, um, you, you've indicated that 90% of, of your goods or items are um, branded items, and then and the 10% will come from. Yes, yeah, so 90% so is of our of private label, and then 10% would be the of our sales is in branded items. So the branded, the national branded items that we stock. Uh, basically, those being products that you, you will find at PKP, that, Spa, and, that's correct, yeah. and the like. Okay. That is correct. Okay, fine. Um, and then, uh, is, is there a difference in terms of how you source the, that 
and the 90 percent from the suppliers? Um, fundamentally not. Uh, in, in, in many of the private label uh, <coughs> products, particularly on the fresh side of our business, but I think it applies in the ambient side of our business as well, um, over the years, the development of the products would have been done uh, collaboratively um, with our suppliers, so that would be one of the differences. Um, but in terms of our relationships with um, those suppliers versus the relationships we have with the, the branded multinationals who supply us, there's, there's the same level of, um, you know, of partnership that exists there. And, and many of the branded multinationals um, are, are equally strategic um, partners within our supply base. So the, perhaps the development of the product, there might have been some differences. There certainly would have been, but outside of that, not, not many. Uh, uh, would you have any specifications, for example, on the product, um, the, the, on that 10% as to how it must be developed for Woolworths purposes? No. So the, the brand is... Still the, the brand same. Is the brand. same product. Yes. Sure. Okay. And then we, we also, uh, with regards to your trading terms uh, and uh, your trading agreements, the, the trading terms that you enter into with your suppliers... Uh, both in the 90% and in the 10%. Yes. Are all those trading terms contained in your trading term uh, in your trading agreements? Everything. We would. In them? They would all be uh, contained, and those those are negotiated on an annual basis. Um, yes, they would all reside there. Okay. And then we um, uh, can you speak through? I don't know if you want to uh, if you want me to go through each question on the on the on the allowances that we wanted to deal with, just to understand. What, what are the basic, do you charge a basic rebate and yes. how is that done Yes. Um, in relation? I don't know if, it, if that would differ to, to the 90% and... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you speak to that? It, 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 it is quite varied. Um, yes. So, uh, generally, um, we, so we, you know, we have a, a basic menu of trading terms um, and they, they, that are comprised of, I'm sure you would have heard it through the week, sort of standard discounts, allowances, etc. Very few are fixed, and there's lots of variability in terms of um, how we apply them. So, you had a question uh, in the in the submission around which are which are which are sort of variable and which are fixed. Yes. And perhaps that would be one way to get to the question. So, we would have there really are three that are that are fixed. The settlement discount would be agreed with the supplier, um, and again within the settlement discount there is a menu. Um, of settlement discounts. So between the supply and ourselves, we would discuss which would be the best um, payment terms and what is the associated discount with that. Just going back on the, on the settlement discount, uh, settlement um, discount. Yes. When you say menu, do you have a, um, in relation to periods? Uh, That's right. Do you have a minimum and a maximum? We do. So we would have a yeah, we would have a, anything from zero yes. all the way through to. Um, Probably four and a half percent, depending on how soon the supplier gets paid. In the period applicable. So also varied. So everything from uh, seven days from statement to thirty to forty-five days of statement. Up to. Forty-five days 45 is the days. is the our preferred menu is um, is is two and a half percent um, on thirty days. Uh, just to uh, warn you, Mr. Son, if you if you don't want, to, we, we really don't want the percentages per se, Fine. Um, because some of that may be confidential. Yes. So we'd be comfortable if you don't want to mention. Yeah. However, if you're talking in general and you're comfortable to yes. um, have those on record, we will allow you to. Um, in the questions that I'm asking you, we will try we will try and avoid anything that goes into yeah. the nature of papers and amounts. Uh, I would pref yeah, we would certainly prefer that. Um, okay. I guess what well, yeah, we were trying to be as transparent as possible. Okay, sure. So they, I appreciate that. Um, so yes, the, the settlement discounts would be a menu of, of options. Mm -hmm. Those will be negotiated between our buying teams and the suppliers. Um, the percentage of discount would apply relative to the payment period. Our payment periods are not exhaustive, uh, are not extensive. Um, so settlement discount would be one, one and, and even within that, Based on where the supply is at, based on how important cash flow is, etc., we would we would apply discretion there. Um, the second is a marketing allowance. 
um, just to go back again to the settlement um, discount, when uh, it's a question I try to understand even with the uh, two retailers that have appeared before us, um, just to understand, we we understand that there's a settlement uh, fee that is charged on the supplier by by the retailer. Does Woolworths uh, charge a, a fee? Is, is there something called a settlement fee that you will deduct from the payment that you you'll be making to the supplier? So as we so in depending on the the days of that the supplier wishes to be paid. Yes. Based on the time value of money, yeah. there is a an agreed settlement um, discount, Dis which the supplier pays to Woolworths. Okay, a discount to Woolworths, to Woolworths. Okay, and and this discount, um, I, um, I, I I try to ask for example, just to understand the rationale of it. You you, you have given us the period of um, you said you, the period itself ranges uh, from anything from seven days to 45 days yes and um, just focus on the maximum let's say if you if, if you've agreed with the supplier that you will pay in 45 days uh, would there still be a settlement fee or discount payable to Woolworths for you meeting that 45 day payment for the fifth day payment yes why is that well, what would be the rationale for so the supplier is getting paid mm -hmm. um, within a reasonable period of time mm -hmm. and for that there is a benefit to the supplier getting paid um, 45 days after statement is a is a reasonable period so that would be the rational as opposed to what uh, what would be the unreasonable period of time when for, when the 45 days is actually the maximum yeah, if, available period I think if you start in your menu so we don't have it in our menu, but if you start getting to sort of you know 60 days, 120 days, um, you know that that stock is is being um, <coughs> has been has turned and been paid for, um, and so as a retailer we would be benefiting from um, having sold that stock whilst the supplier still hasn't been paid. So it's not a um, beyond a certain period. We don't think that's reasonable. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to understand is if the um, when you agree on the on the on the, on the settlement period uh, is is it a settlement period that is favorable in mo in all cases where the settlement discount is applicable? We believe so. Is it, is it favorable to the supplier? We absolutely believe so. Okay. And the the supplier would. The supplier would be able to compare that with, uh, particularly if they're supplying others, yes. they would be able to make that comparison and um, and we believe it is, it is reasonable, yes. Okay. And then um, you also mentioned that you, uh, uh, just, just can you speak um, extensively or just maybe for the record, I mean, you may have given up this to us uh, previously, but we just want to understand uh, how do you, how, how does Woolworths work with its suppliers? Do you have a, a confined list of suppliers that are only Woolworths suppliers outside of that 10%? So I'm talking about the 90% yes. now yes. Uh, of, of the branded Woolworths uh, products. Uh, how, how does Woolworths work with those yeah. if that is not confidential? Um, I don't think it is. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite happy to share with you that we have within our supplier base um, by 450 to 500 suppliers uh, ac across across the the spectrum, mm -hmm. um, and you know those will go from very small one line suppliers to quite big uh, branded multinational suppliers who supply us a basket of goods. Um, but I think the the point I would like to make is it's not a it's not a small dedicated list of um, of suppliers, there's, there's, there's quite a wide variety of suppliers and, and very diverse in their makeup. Okay. Uh, you've also mentioned that um, uh, some of these, well, I, I, I'm not sure if I can say a number of them, are suppliers that you, that have been with, uh, yes. with, with you um, over, many in, years. over the years and you even mentioned that up to 60 years yes. with some of them. 
um, some of them having been backyard suppliers. That's right. Um, can you can you just explain how you would have initiated? How how, how would uh, Woolworth, how would Woolworths start working with a supplier? Yes. Uh, do you have specifications that are Woolworth specific? And uh, we just need to understand how different you operate yes. to other suppliers. Yes. Because in most instances, we understand that there would be a supplier in in the in the open market. Uh, let's say spa, pick and pay shop right. Uh, um, Mr. Kumalo would produce his product and approach uh, would, um, spa, pick and pay, or shop right yes. to, um, to, have, to, to have his product on their shelf. Yes. So in your case, how would that process work? Fine. C good question. So the, the vast majority of the products that are... In the 90%. In the 90% 90, 90 would be... Um, the vast majority of them would be products that we have worked with a supplier on products we've identified as opposed to um, we're, we're not a, a retailer that is um, that is approached often by suppliers to say we've got this product for you and um, not saying that that doesn't happen so that certainly has happened and there, there are certainly suppliers who have been successful in, in that space but classically we'd look for an artisanal chocolate supplier uh, we would read the trends, we would understand that that's an opportunity for us to differentiate ourselves in the market, um, and then we would look to... What do you mean by an artisan chocolate supplier? So a, ch a chocolate supplier that is not a mass producer of chocolate that, you know, that, that uh, in some instances will go all the way from the cocoa bean to the actual slab, uh, which really works for us because we can guarantee the integrity of the product all the way through and it offers us a point of difference and it fits into our customer segment. So we would we would look to find suppliers like that and, and they the opportunities are far less now than they would have been in the past. Uh, in the past we would have you know traveled the world, seen where some of these uh, innovations are and then come back home and look to find those suppliers locally. There was uh, there were far more opportunities then, as you can imagine, but those opportunities still still exist today, just mm. just not as many of them. We would then look at that supplier, assess their manufacturing capability, processing facility, etc., um, and then work with them to be able to bring that product to market more often than not. In fact, probably 99% of the time in our private label, but you could find that there's a artisanal brand um, that's well-loved out in the marketplace that would be relevant. Um, so it's not only about the national brands, the fast-moving consumer good brands. It could be a uh, it could be a brand that's that's local, uh, locally inspired, um, that would complement our offer. So um, a typical uh, in that um, when a supplier supplies supplies a, a, a Woolworths branded product, would they be um, only supplying that and, and nothing else and therefore not supplying the rest of the market? Some, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Okay. So in some cases, we've got, and, and over the evolution of time, it also changes. So uh, if I just go back to my chocolate example again, we, this is the chocolate supplier, uh, who is now quite a mainstream supplier of yes. ours, yes. Um, started out being very small as they've built uh, their facility and have needed to see more volume and throughput through their factories they've gone and supplied. Others, we've always generally worked with them on that um, and tried to make sure that there's a degree of differentiation between what we have and what others have. That's mm -hmm. really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, but and in some cases, um, if I take our prepared food, for example, mm -hmm. uh, we're very protective of those being exclusive, um, uh, exclusive suppliers to us. So, and, and, and that would be a category for category uh, based on where we believe we want to um, hold the high ground, um, and we'd be very, very protective of that. Um, w w would I be correct then to, to deduce from what you've just said that you don't place any limitations on, the, on who the supplier can supply, however, you will have, um, uh, you will place some limitation on the specification of the product that they, they, may, they may be supplying to Woolworths, uh, that uh, that product does not become available necessarily to your competitors. We, we would do the latter. Yes. We will also be very uh, circumspect about whether the supplier supplies others, yes. depending on what the product is and okay. depending on 
strategically how important it is to us, and also the degree to which we've had involvement in developing the IP of the product. We, um, so so we, we will, in certain instances, will get to a point with the supplier where, um, fortunately, in most cases, neither of us want that the supplier supplies anybody else. But if the supplier did want to do that, that does end up being quite an energetic conversation um, okay. about, about that particular item. But broadly speaking, um, you know, we 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 we're able to we're able to resolve that. Mm -hmm. And um, does Woolworths have any uh, damaged goods uh, allowance? And how does that how is that um, implemented between uh, so you and the supplier? So damaged goods, as you know, uh, goods that get damaged Good, in our yeah, system, and you have to return them or whatever. How how, how does that process work? Yes. So it's there are various parts of it. It's quite a quite a refined process within our business. Um, so for starters, I think the identification of where the damage occurs is really important so that you can place liability where it should be. And that um, it's, it's often a gray area uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broad chain. Uh, we try our best to be able to get to, to identify at least broadly where that is. Most of our suppliers, if not all of our suppliers, um, and the goods that they supply us will hold retention samples of the batches that they send us. So the goods will come into our stores, they'll hold retention samples. If we find the product to be defective, uh, we'll go back to their retention samples. If they find it to be defective, clearly something happened in the factory. We also have, um, you know, I, th I guess, various critical control points. Um, we do temperature checks at our distribution center. We do temperature checks in our stores. Um, Sometimes if a product still gets through all of that and it's a little bit gray about you know, where the liability sits, we, we have to apply some logic and judgment and we apply some broad principles. If a product is found to be defective in near 100% of our stores, it's quite plausible to determine that the product was problematic from the source. If it is in a few stores, it's very plausible that actually the, the fault started within within the within the Woolworths sort of because once we take it in from the distribution center we take responsibility for it I would also say that um, uh, sorry, any, uh, just yeah. just on that um, uh, uh, c can you link that um, where, where you take the risk and then uh, the, when the supplier takes the risk yes with, with regard to this allowance is it a is it a, is it a fixed amount that is just charged uh, at any point or uh, that is agreed upon in advance. So, so, so that's so we don't necessarily agree with an. We don't agree. We don't necessarily. We don't have an allowance as a general principle across. Sure. In some suppliers, where we particularly where we have, we warehouse the goods, mm -hmm. there is a, a swell allowance that might or might not be applied. It's also not standard. Sure. Um, on the fresh side of our business, there wouldn't be any allowance. So, um, a product would be delivered to us. Uh, and if it's defective, we would uh, we would classically action a what we call a return to vendor. If the product has been, yeah, we can determine that it's the supplier uh, liability. Um, and so we you basically embark on this uh, exercise of determining where yes. when this could have Criti occurred. Critical. Okay. Um, and then f for all of the rest, so we don't have a sale or return policy. Mm -hmm. Any product that's not defective, it comes into our chain, runs through our chain, and um, doesn't sell within shelf life, we absorb the cost of, of that. We, so we take full ownership once it hits the distribution center. Okay. And w w with regards to the damaged goods or re goods that you have to return to the supplier, uh, how, do, uh, how does that work? Do, do they, would it be, would there be, would, they, would you have charged them an, an allowance um, uh, for the damage? Or is it, is it charged at the point where you have to return? How, how, what are the mechanics of that? How does it exactly work? Yeah, it's, um, you, we have um, some I, I'm thinking about this because I know you've got a very strict process um, yes. uh, t uh, uh, for, for your customers. Where yes. you say, if return, they're not happy, bring it then back. bring it back. We won't yes. charge you for it. Yes. And I, I'm trying to understand who then bears for the, uh, the, cost. The, the cost of that product yes. when you do that. Is it your cost, at your cost, or at the cost of the supplier? Right, so if, uh, you know, if there's just gross negligence, um, the product is found to be defective, um, our suppliers also have insurance against that. Mm -hmm. um, the, 
and it'll vary. So the degree of the loss is um, borne by the supplier through them not recouping what they've, so they've put all of the manufacturing cost in, we return it. Um, there's no penalty associated with that, it's really, the, it's really the, the goods get returned, they don't make the sale and they've incurred the loss of the production of the product. Okay. Um, in, in <coughs> we bear the loss through, because we don't have a wide repertoire of choice, um, you know, if our poultry supplier uh, delivered off chicken in Gauteng, there's really two you know, a commercial chicken supply and a free range supply. If it's the commercial chicken and we have to return all the chicken, our supplier would sit with a loss of that. We would sit with a loss sales because we don't have an alternative to put on the counter. So um, whilst they bear the direct loss, we would bear the indirect loss of that as well. You've mentioned you, that you've got three distribution centers. Yes. Um, do you charge allowances on your supplies for, is there any distribution fee? So the... Or, or which, warehousing fee, uh, allowance. So as I say, in some of, some of the instances with the, long life, with the longer shelf life supplies, there would be um, a, just, uh, a warehouse allowance that can be applied, might be applied, is not strictly speaking applied, we would have, that would be part of the negotiation. So there's no blanket approach? No blanket approach, but it, it would be one of, you made reference to our trading terms, mm -hmm. um, if supplier Kumalo um, did have that, it would be contained on their trading terms, but sure. supplier um, X might not have it. Okay. And um, uh, on your, do you have anything called redistribution allowance? No. It's something we've heard of? No. Okay. You don't have that? Drop shipment allowances? No. Nope. You don't have those? Okay. And category management allowances? We don't have that either. Okay. Central office allowance? Nope. You don't. And then uh, advertising allowance, you, you were about to say that. Let's speak on, on that. Yeah, so um, we, have a, we have a standard marketing allowance which all suppliers would pay a percentage of, uh, a very low percentage of. Um, really to help us drive the growth of the category, um, either through advertising or through promotion. Um, it's negotiated annually, um, and it um, it is part of this. It would also be contained in the in the terms, um, and that would be so. That would be one of the so that would be the sort of what we would we'd phrase it the, as the marketing allowance, which which sits as a, as a standard part of our terms. In addition to that. Uh, there might be and will be in certain categories um, a promotional allowance. Mm -hmm. Certain categories which um, predominantly see quite high uplifts of promotion um, would together with the retailer invest uh, in making sure that we have an allowance that allows us to um, promote those products um, <coughs> at sort of um, frequent levels, whether it's month end or every quarter, um, and that's more of an ad hoc uh, spend, which again would be negotiated with the supplier up front. If we're going to have 12 promotions across the year, how would we together fund that? We'd obviously take a cost price reduction. The supplier uh, would look to help to support that so that we can offer a discount that doesn't totally erode our profitability uh, collectively. And uh, do you charge any, uh, when you open a new store, is there a new store allowance? That Ab you charge? Absolutely not, no. You don't charge that? Not to the suppliers, no. Okay. Um, um, and for refurbishments, do you charge any? No. No. Okay. Uh, we, 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 also, we understand that um, um, you, you're one of the stores that will charge, for example, that you'll ask your developer to put up the fittings for you. Is, is that something, is that a blanket approach or is it something that you'll do in certain instances? Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, the norm is generally uh, that the, the, the developer would uh, put our specifications in for us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's similar to the other retailers as well, the other food retailers. You, you say it's similar to? It's similar to the other food retailers. Okay. So what we call a grey box, or you know, grey box meaning it's a bare concrete with nothing in it, and, yeah. and the tenant arrives and then puts ceilings, flooring, lighting, electricity, DB boards, everything else in. That's not the case. Yeah. That only happens mostly outside the borders of South Africa. 
in the borders of South Africa for food stores uh, by, by and large. And nearly all the, the, the sites that we do go in, there is a specification that the owner of the, or the developer of the centre is putting in for us. So he will put in the ceiling, sprinklers, air conditioning, uh, mm. um, dock levelers and what else you need in the back of the house, your know, offices, etc. Okay, and the refrigeration and stuff like that, do, do you put yourselves? No, or the refrigeration, the plant, normally we would install ourselves, but the cold rooms, they might build the cold rooms, but we will do the on-floor refrigeration, so there's sometimes a split between the two. Oh, okay. So uh, whatever they put in, would, be, would that be their... Would it be owned by them? Ye in terms ye of your yes, it's owned by them. And when we, when the lease comes to an end, uh, and we decide to, uh, to move on or yes. close the store, uh, yes. that reverts back to them. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, we we have a responsibility to maintain that plant. Yeah. Uh, for example, if we trade there for many many uh, years, the the lift at some point might not work anymore. Yes. Then we need to prove for the air condition that we have maintained it and serviced it as per the specifications. <laughs> okay. And then they will do the capital replacement there. Okay. So, um, <coughs> Mr. Tivilias, where you have, uh, uh, you've been running, say, in a center, just a Woolies clothing uh, store, and you wanted uh, to, to add a, a, a food, a Woolies food in, within that store, um, you don't require the developer to contribute to that, uh, you know, to that work of putting in. Um, the wool is food. It very uh, seldom happens. Uh, so normally uh, if we were to have a clothing only and we extend the store, uh, the developer would still put the infrastructure in. Sometimes he, if we execute the work, he might give us a contribution to do the work. But in cases where we can hoard it off and it's behind the scenes in the line store next door, he would fit it out most of the cases. In some cases where we've taken it on board, uh, it, it is purely because the developer might not have the skill set to do it himself. Uh, uh, but we prefer not to play uh, builder as, as far as possible and take on the construction risk. Uh, it's something we're trying to eliminate. Um, uh, um, just to go back on your presentation, you oh, 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 just focusing on the food side of your business, what would be the minimum, uh, uh, minimum of your food size, uh, size of your food stores, and the maximum you can have? What is that range? Yeah. Um, that's no minimum, um, and Maurice must just help me. Um, the minimum size of our food. Uh, you talking about product range or size of store? Size of the store in square meters. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Right. Okay, the, the, the minimum size is maybe an engine in a forecourt where we would operate uh, in conjunction with engine, probably yes. have about 36 square meters of trading space, floor space. Within that? Within the engine forecourt. Uh, yeah. Then when it comes to our small uh, local stores, they tend, we tend to trade on, on 350, 300, so it's a shell of about 500 square meters, 450, 500. Mm -hmm. And from there it starts stepping up to our biggest standalone food stores uh, is about 3,000 square meters. <coughs> but if you look at a total store with food and clothing combined, uh, those stores sizes can go up to about 14,000 square meters. Okay, sure. You, you also m mentioned that you significantly invest in cold chain. Can you just explain what that means? Um, I just unpack that for us to understand, or maybe for the record. Um, so it's really ensuring that we've got... Um, the, the maintenance of the temperatures we set for our products to service them optimally to our customers right through the chain. So what it means is we should do temperature probes. So that was a, that's what I was trying to make reference to is the infrastructural investment into the maintenance of cold chain runs right across the, the supply chain. Um, you, you also mentioned that, uh, I just want to understand now, with regards to the, your suppliers, again, for the 90%. Yes. Um, can we understand this to mean the bulk of those suppliers are suppliers that Woolworths would have approached because you kind of know what you're looking for and you approach the suppliers to 
uh, and then with your specifications, and then is, is, am I, are we correct to understand that? Um, Those to be the case. Many of them we would have approached, uh, and remembering that we have uh, partnerships that span 20 to 30 years uh, back then, we would have approached those suppliers. It's also, I think, important to note that some of the branded multinational suppliers that we have also supply us in our private label, so they don't they don't only supply um, the the brands. Yeah. Um, and so, in those instances, those products might have existed or existed in the marketplace. Um, and the supplier, uh, in, cons in uh, discussion with ourselves, um, produces a private label um, version of those products for us to our specification agreed with the supplier. Okay. Do you charge a listing fee? We don't charge a listing fee as a standard practice. Uh, it's not oh. a policy uh, of ours. Um, it is something which, if offered, um, is something we would consider. Um, and there would have been instances where, but as a standard practice, um, it's not a condition of doing business or something that we would necessarily put on the table. Um, so you don't have anything that looks like a listing fee in the Woolets? If uh, the, the area where, we, where listing fees would more likely find themselves and probably exclusively find themselves is in the in the branded so the 10 percent uh, yes. of sales space yeah. where oh. it is more of a common practice it's yes. not um it's not something um in the fresh part of our business we we have any interest in in necessarily exploring uh, yeah, that's, why, uh, that's why i was asking this question because if, if in most instances you approach your suppliers it wouldn't make sense to then charge them a listing fee. That's right. Because it's not like they approach you. That's right. Okay, fine. And um, you also spoke about the, this, your, your sponsor entry program. Um, sorry. Sorry. Okay, my colleague just wants to I'm, I'm not sure whether you, you had completed, uh, you had answered all the questions around the uh, trading terms. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to avoid us going to something Thank else before you. and then taking you back to trading terms. But you had initially said when you were discussing the, the, um, the settlement terms, you had said it was one of the three fixed. That's right. I'm not sure if the, the, yes. the others that you have discussed yeah. now yeah. are part of those. And, and can, if you can just close that one out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. The, so the marketing allowance was the other one. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the third one is a, was a brand integrity um, um, allowance that is um, a standard part of us being able to uh, assess and audit our suppliers in terms of the, it's exactly that, the integrity of our brand, um, that it is being managed from a quality, hygiene, and ethics point of view. Um, and then it's there's an additional one, but it's not a standard uh, because in some instances it doesn't exist, and that's the base rebate, which is a, a rebate which we would have with the supplier um, as a percentage of um, of the business that we do with that supplier. Um, but it's not a um, actual absolute precursor to be able to supply us. That um, exists in the vast majority of products. We, there would be a base rebate, um, but there are certainly some areas where where that is um, forfeited. There is no no rebate. Okay, and then uh, other than those, I assume those are the fixed ones. What are the ones that are not fixed? So the non-fixed ones would be um, sort of a, a promotional fund, which which might exist with certain suppliers and not with others. The warehouse allowance might exist with some and not with others. Uh, those would be the types of uh, discretionary funds that that um, or discretionary allowances that we would that we would um, have. Uh, and and how does that work? I mean, how do you decide which suppliers? Yeah. Um, are going to be are going to be uh, rewarding you for those. Uh, uh, yeah. Which one so it, you know, it really comes down to the to we we literally sit across the table from the supplier and have a discussion about um, where we believe it's more justified or not justified. Some um, of the allowances might be proposed through the conversation by the supplier as opposed to. Um, a base rebate, it may make more sense for us to have a swell allowance. Um, there are additional um, incentives which, as partners, we drive, like a growth incentive, where 
Um, it places the onus on us as the retailer to support the growth of a certain category. And in order for that allowance to kick in, which is a benefit to us, um, we've got to grow the category to a certain level. So um, I think I said earlier, the, the trading terms is an annually negotiated uh, discussion um, where uh, yeah, we would sit down and say, you know, what's, what's feasible, what makes sense in this particular category that we're supplying. Um, in, in, if, I, if I use an example like milk, which is a, um, a very competitively priced product, and if you're not competitive, you are going to see your volumes decline, it might make, not make sense for us to have a base rebate, which then um, ultimately comes back in the cost of the product that gets passed on to the customer. It might make more sense to have a promotional um, allowance that we um, manage together to be able to promote that product. Um, which the supplier is willing to contribute to um, at various times of the year. So uh, those would be, I, th I think that's the, the sort of the tone and the nature of the kind of conversations that happen when, when there the really isn't a sort of a one-size-fits-all other than those uh, sort of three component parts of the, of, of the allowances that we would, we, would, we would see as part of the trading terms. And the size of the supplier, um, does it critical? Make, is it? Is yes. critical to whether or not they are charged. Uh, critical. The, the, the size and the nature. Um, so when we talk to our branded multinational suppliers, this is, a, this is a, an area they're far more familiar with. Um, and so it would be something that they can reference against what they do with others. They obviously supply. Um, we have a supplier uh, who we've, uh, um, ED supplier, black owned business, who cash flow is fundamentally important to them. They get paid. Uh, seven days. Um, normally, to be paid in seven days, it would attract a discount because we, we're paying you, you know, quite quickly after statement. In that particular instance, we, there's a zero discount, so that it's in both of our interests that that supply is successful. And so we would uh, we would negotiate with that as the the overriding context. Um, and those are just examples of uh, the nature of those conversations that I had with in agreeing that. I, I was asking you about your, you said you've got the sponsor entry uh, program of new suppliers. Yes. Um, can you just speak more on that and also, uh, and what percentage of your supply, like, uh, how, is it, like how, how does this fit into the bigger Woolworths program yes. of developing, or, or, or on supplier development? Yes. So we've... Um, yeah, yeah, if you permit, I'd, I'd prefer not to talk about the percentages, but I can give you the broad flavor of, yeah. so we've set aside as a business yeah. to uh, invest a, s a percentage of um, net profit after tax uh, into our supply development program, and we make that available to suppliers on a, a loan basis, um, and um, it would start with... Uh, demand for the product um, because what we have found is to just bring products into the business uh, because there's a great story behind them or because the business is black owned is not necessarily the most sustainable or isn't the most sustainable uh, way to grow a business um, and so it starts with where there's a demand um, the supplier I was referencing earlier um, on the pet food side which is a black owned business uh, we used to import those products from Ireland, and we wanted to bring that locally. Um, and there was a, a business that was about to be um, set up by um, three black industrialists who um, have experience in the pet food um, area, and but needed funding to set that facility up. It's obviously a high-tech um, business. We funded uh, part of that. Um, and through our funding of it, other funding houses like the DTI, PIC, sometimes the banks, on the basis that Woolworths is willing to fund the supplier, gives the supplier access to other sources of funding that then helps them get into the market. So um, those are, the, those are the, the ways that we go about that. Okay. You also meant, uh, and then um, linking that question to what you said about, um, you said 84% of uh, your Woolworths food stores are located in the in the metropolitan areas, yes. and only about 16% uh, in the country towns. Yes. 
and, that, and, and you specifically say that PE is London and Bloemfontein. Um, does does Woolworths ha have any presence in the townships? Um, and what is truly rural areas, let's say, Transkei, Toyando, this is on the food side. Until answer that one. Yes, we do have exposure. Uh, the most recent one we opened is in Toyondo. We just opened a food market in Toyondo when the new mall launched there. Mm -hmm. uh, we we did trial to expand our footprint for foods in, in into the country towns and the outlying areas, mm -hmm. uh, but also the transport cost is quite uh, <coughs> quite prohibitive relative to the turnover that we can do. So, it's a function of the size of the market. Uh, and, and the potential turnover that we can do in those markets. We also trade, for example, in, in, in Umtata, mm. uh, uh, by, by example. So. Okay. Um, just linking that to your supply development program, to what extent um, does Woolworths, for example, source um, its uh, fresh products, or, pr or any products for that matter, on the mm. food side, um, in those areas, Umtata mm. or in Toyando? Mm. Uh, from, from the local communities, and we, we, we gave a context to everyone we've asked this question to, that we've had a lot of complaints from um, these communities, uh, especially black communities, where they feel uh, supermarket chains have come and set up shop in their areas, mm -hmm. and uh, affecting the previous retailers that were there, or, or, in, or mm -hmm. driving them out of the market. Mm -hmm. And these are retailers that used to source from them, and they cannot even supply these new uh, supermarket chains. And I just want to understand then, uh, to what extent are you, as Woolworths, supportive of the manufacturers and producers in the communities, yes. in those areas specifically? I could say previously disadvantaged yes. areas. Yeah. So, um, so some of these facilities, uh, some of these suppliers are, have a presence in the metropolitan areas where we trade. They've built yeah. factories there. Mm -hmm. In the case of more on the agricultural side um, mm -hmm. within our grower base, there certainly are um, farmers and growers and suppliers that then supply into our um, established <coughs> suppliers. That, so they would uh, um, supply a specific raw material or help to, to, uh, to compensate or complement the the volume that the supplier um, that supplies directly into us has. In mm -hmm. some cases, those suppliers will direct uh, supply directly into us. Um, it's something which I don't think we're doing enough of. Yeah. And something that uh, I made reference earlier to um, our aspiration in terms of increasing our black yes. spend. Uh -huh. So what often happens is you'll have a supplier uh, that is able to get a piece of land next to a farmer that supplies lettuce into ourselves mm. and we would strike up a relationship between all the supply or our sub direct supplier would have a relationship with that grower and they would supply their lettuce into our supplier they then don't have to set up a pack house um, and all of the costs that go with supplying woolies and they're able to build their business mm. so that over time they can become a direct supplier to us um, as well rather than putting all of that onerous strain on them from the start to you know manage cash flow invest well ahead of the curve um, when their volumes are still quite small. Um, so I think um, we do have it. We don't have enough of it. It's something that should be a, an ease, a big focus of ours going forward. Okay. Just to be more specific, um, and if you don't, if you, if, if you may not, if you're not able to answer these questions because you're not, um, uh, you don't have the information, and the information may be there, but you just it's not it's not something that you 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 were prepared to answer yeah. here today um just to for example look to to look at your toyando uh, uh food store um are you, are you sourcing from any local black yeah. suppliers yeah. there yeah so the that's one of the challenges with centralized distribution mm. is our ability to um source locally mm. from the local community for the local store yeah um, so we don't have a we don't have a, a holding point. Well, we don't have an aggressive strategy. Firstly, to uh, expand our stores into the into township areas. Yeah. Um, so that's that's the first point, which I think would make us quite different to some of the retailers you might have been describing earlier. Um, but where we are, and not only um, not only necessarily in those areas, there are local communities surrounding existing stores where we would like to be able to 
offer those local producers access to our stores. Yeah. Our current model doesn't facilitate that easily because yeah. everything is centrally distributed and centrally planned. Sure. Um, so the flexibility we have within a store and still maintain the rules controls is something we have to apply our minds to, to, okay. to address. Um, and I, would, uh, I, can't, I can't speak um, with any degree of confidence, but I don't know whether, I don't believe we're sourcing anything specifically from Toyondo. Okay. Well, would this um, challenge apply to PE, East London, Umtata? Broadly, yes. Madam Chair, just to add, our exposure into those markets in terms of trading square metrics is actually very small in relative to the total chain. Okay. Um, I, I know you've indicated that you don't have any exclusive leases. Um, what is always for you on exclusive leases? Or, or, or sorry, so let, let me put this question differently. What does Woolworths understand to be the purpose of exclusive leases uh, by those retailers that do contain them in their lease agreements? I think the, the purpose of they're trying to control their market, they make an investment, it is about de-risking their investment mm -hmm. um, because most retailers will trade better on their own, mm -hmm. meaning as the sole supermarket in the shopping center versus uh, having three other centers that, uh, or three other stores that are selling the same kind of products as they do. So it is, it is about protecting their investment and protecting their growth going forward. I think that's why those clauses uh, came about mm -hmm. historically. Um, in, in instances where some of, uh, of these exclusive clauses, close, uh, clauses have been in existence for for a very long time and um, creating a concern uh, for, 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 for this inquiry, what would be, um, how would you suggest that uh, this inquiry approaches this? Uh, in terms of the duration, what duration would you propose, but also um, what factors would you like us to consider? What, what would you suggest that we look at if, if you wanted to uh, encourage that the market does away with these exclusivity, exclusivity agreements? I know that's a difficult question and not an easy, I don't know how to structure it myself, but basically we, we just want to, uh, want to understand from, a, from a, a player in the market, you facing them, you experiencing them, and um, um, and if you don't if you don't apply them, surely you've been a victim to them. And we, we want to understand that there's an element of protection. There's or there may be a, a just a good justification for having them initially. And we are, we want to understand then should we want to should there be a, a suggestion to do away with them at some point? What that point? What should that point be? And what should what, what would you suggest or assist us on? The justification for doing away with them, or the basis. What basis can we put forward to any to the retailer that still contains and that still practices these and comfortably does so? Maybe, Madam Chair, to answer you to start with with, with the end. I, th I think exclusive leases over the over the history um, in, in in South Africa has really driven a fragmentation of the market. Mm -hmm. So for us, it is uh, more important to have as many of the retailers in a single center because you want to create dominance, you want to create maximum feed, maximum energy, maximum destination, maximum pull. If there's exclusivity, all it means somebody gets left out and it drives another center down the road and it drives another center further down the road. And over a period of time, you then, uh, and all of those centers also need line stores and small retailers, and not everyone can survive. Some centers are, have a greater ability to pull everyone compared to somebody who's not. And so you see property investment, investments being made that cannot, is not sustainable in the long run because somebody comes and puts something up down the road that's more attractive, <coughs> more nicer. Uh, uh, and uh, not everyone can come in. So from our perspective, we, we did run into exclusivities. 
Uh, we don't like them. We do, do not support them. I think they are very different to the duration of lease. They, in my mind, are two fundamentally different items. As to your question what to do with it, you know, our view is they, they should not be there in, uh, in the marketplace. I think uh, if, if the playing field is level, everyone up front can decide whether they enter into the scheme or not enter into the scheme. I can understand why some of the retailers feel aggrieved about it because they invested, they took the risk to build the scheme up and, and got it through its growth years. Most centers can take three, four years. Big super regionals can take up to five years before they really start <coughs> working and shifting the market and build their customer base. Uh, and they have gone that road. So they, they supported, didn't trade well, uh, and, and had to support the growth of that. So there's a strong argument to say, now that the center finally reached its dominance, and I was a key part of getting you to, to be successful, now you bring somebody else in and I lose 20% of my trade. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you're splitting the trade. Because ultimately the trade in, in a given market is the cake is the size of the cake. It's not by putting another retailer in that the cake gets bigger. The cake just gets cut up differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex, uh, com a complex uh, uh, space. But from, from our perspective, we would prefer that they're not there. And, uh, what is your view to the, the restriction of sizes? Because we've also seen that way um, some of the retailers that um, used to have uh, exclusivity clauses um, will, will then waive exclusivity in favor of uh, allowing a competitor to come in, um, but restrict the size of that, oper of that uh, operator's business. And what is your view to that? that it is, in my mind, the same thing. There's no difference between the two. It's still an exclusivity because they're saying, I, I'm allowing you in, but I don't want you to grow. I'm allowing you in because we want Woolworths, in, in our case, we want you to bring the high Allison feet in, but I don't want you to get too big so that you can compete with us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, and, and, and uh, so from our perspective, it's, it's, it's one and the same thing. Um. Uh, yesterday we had a discussion with a uh, with a, with a bank that gave us some insights on 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 looking at a success of a, of a development, for example, which goes to the point that you made that um, the, 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 the the justification, the initial justification for these exclusive leases would be would be that um, I was there from the beginning and assisted you to grow this development to where it is. At a point where it starts to make money, you then bring in a, a competitor which starts to erode on the turnover and revenue that I could have, uh, that I could have, that I could make going forward. Um, um, we, we, in, in, in trying to understand what would, um, what would define, if we were to look at an existing development, new development is a different, um, situation altogether, but when you look at uh, exclusive leases that are, uh, 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 that are um, in long existing developments, for example, we were told that um, one of the key things that, um, that, that would define the success of that development would be the, 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 the customer fit, the footfall, which must tra translate into tr um, trading, what do they call it? Trading density, yes, trading density. And w would you say that that's what, that would be a fair way of looking at whether uh, a, a, a development or a shopping center is actually, uh, is actually a successful um, uh, center for us to make a determination as to whether or not um, any existing leases or ex exclusive leases are justified? I think it's very difficult to, to try and make a call on the back of trading densities whether somebody is successful or not successful and hence whether exclusivity should be waived or not because I think trading densities is impacted by so many economic factors uh, um, uh, that uh, and, and the demographic of the market in which you trade and how that market is growing or not growing. 
and the disposable income in that market. So I think that's a, that's a very difficult one. I think the cleanest way is either to say, you know, in terms of the historic agreements to define a period and saying after if the lease has been running for so long, it, it's not important anymore. And, 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 and a ruling need to be made about going forward whether these, these exclusivities are being, uh, are being allowed or not. I know a lot of our landlords are insisting and trying not to enter yeah. into, uh, into, into those agreements. What, what, what if there's a, a clear pattern that shows growth in the trading densities in relation to, to, to a particular development, for example, w would that still be a, an issue if one looks at the trading, de de trading densities? Uh, yes, you would. But, I mean, remember, you not trade in, a nu uh, in an isolated nucleus. It's quite one-dimensional mm -hmm. looking at it because two, three centers could have opened over the period just in that same trade node. Yes. Uh, because of the exclusivity, it happened. And so the trading densities will soften so that that center automatically, because of the exclusivity, would lose 20%, 30% of its turnover because sure. it's just going down the road to a more exciting uh, center. Uh -huh. And then how do you deal with that in, in the trading numbers? And now it's saying it's soft, therefore you're going to perpetuate the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the period. Okay, in fact, we, we, we went into specific uh, specifics um, in relation to this or on the centers themselves, and we, we, we uh, there was a discussion on uh, with one of the stakeholders on, for example, and it, it, on, on, on the Four Ways Mall, and we were told that if you look at Four Ways Mall, Four Ways Mall does not compete necessarily as a mall. Um, it does not compete with the other shopping centers that are that you find there. There's pines, uh, pine slopes where there's pick and pay. There's leaping frog where there's um, uh, sh a shop right, and um, just a kilometer Cedar or less. Square. There's Cedar Square with pick and pay and Woolworths, and Woolworths is also at Forest Mall, yep. and there's Woolworths down the road in Broadacre Shopping Center, and another one further down as you go towards Dainton. And um, w what is your view on what is what would be? What is your view, uh, Maurice, on this? With, uh, do those centers, small centers, co compete with Foy's Mall, in your view? You have a Woolworths there. Yes, they, they, they do. Back to the initial example, there's so, just so much food spent in that total node. Yeah. And they get carved up in a different way. But Of course, the shopping purposes are all different. Mm. Whether it's pine slopes or cedar, mm. uh, it is about convenience. It's on my way home, left hand side, left in. I don't pay for parking. I can yeah. buy bread and milk, a cup of coffee. I can meet my friends and move on. I can want to spend half a day in a shopping center, then I'll go to four ways. Mm. I want to go fashion. I want to see a variety of different fashion stores. The, so the purpose of shop is different. Yeah. But the, and, and we know typically in, in a four ways, in big regional malls, there's a certain size that you can take a food store to. Because Four Ways Mall, Santon can't fulfill a convenient shop purpose. So if, if the intention of the shopper is about pure convenience, they will visit the convenience center. It's about in and out, the ability to stop in front of the front door, walk in, get my goods, climb in a car, and leave again as quickly as possible, and preferably not pay for parking. Uh, let, me, let me be more specific to Woolworths. For example, you opened your Woolworths at Cedar Square yes, long after the, the Woolworths at Four Ways Mall yep. had been operating. Um, and on the point that, on, on, if we were to look at trading densities and, and whether there's competition or not, you said you, the point you made that you could lose some people to trade to to the new development, and therefore it's difficult to, to focus on one dimension when you measure whether or not yeah. there's a development or there's there's a there's a growing yeah. uh, trading density. Um, in the case of Fuller's, did you exp experience any drop? In the, in the sales or in the food fall that um, uh, in relation to your food, um, Ulwe, Ulwe, Ulwe's food in um, Four Ways Mall as a result of you opening Let me um, the one in uh, Cedar Square? Yes, no, no, I understand. Let me answer you in this way. The, the, the drive to convenience is mm. extremely strong. Yeah. So whether we participate in that drive to convenience and open a store uh, in Cedar Square was in order to be able to play in the environment of convenience. Sure. People on their way homeward bound is a market that we're not capturing in, in four ways more. Sure. Now when we did open, we did calculate and anticipate that we will take sales out of uh, out of four ways more and the trading densities 
for a period of time would shrink and then over time it will uh, it would it should should recover again but on the total basis it was still better off for us to open and see the square and, and it, it made financially sense for us to open a, a big store in Cedar Square, and we recently extended the store in, in Cedar Square. To, to capture that convenience uh, market? capture that convenient market. Because you'll find customers, the, the purpose of shop and why they go there are two, are really fundamentally different between Four Ways Mall and, and, and... So you're uh, basically saying that um, th there's a difference. Um, we also need to look at the purpose of the shopper. Yeah. And, oh, okay. So a, a, a customer that goes to a shopping mall is looking for a different thing to that of a, a shopper who goes to a, a convenience center like Cedar Square, yeah. Gold Acres. And, and, and maybe to add, you, you can have external factors. Mm -hmm. Our turnover in, in four ways is probably half of what it used to be. Purely because construction or the intersections or the roadworks that's happening. Or, so there is so much external factors. The wealth is there. Yeah. They're not either shopping or different. They change their shopping pattern. So there is a lot of factors that can happen in the center. Mm -hmm what you pay for part of the construction to your ability to get in and out of those environments that has an impact on trading densities. And that's why, in my, my view, trading Let's density... Let's say prior to the construction, because the construction at Four is, uh, is, 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 is fairly recent. I mean, it's in the past two years that you, you started experiencing that. Yeah. But um, Four Ways Mall, Woolworths has been existence in existence, uh, and as well, I mean, with, uh, has been co coexisting with the one in Cedar Square, for example. What, what was the what was your experience then prior to the construction of the roads as well of the mall? Yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in a clean scenario, if one uh, compare, <coughs> compares it, there will be transfer or cannibalization. There always okay. is. There always is. Okay. And whether we did open or not, and it was in a very attractive convenience center, we in Four Ways Mall would have, would have still lost the sales. W would that make uh, Four Ways, the, the, your Woolworths in Four Ways Mall a competitor to the one in Cedar Square, therefore? Would you consider, would, would Woolworths and Four Ways Mall consider the one in Cedar Square to be a competitor to itself, to be competing with it? No, not really. I mean, they, they Because they're, they're looking at different, they're they're different they're shopper. They fulfill different a shopper. different purpose, you know. Yes. I, yes, there is some comp level of competition between the two, but they fulfill a different uh, uh, Chair, if I could maybe just add to that. Um, so classically what we would do in those formats as well is it's, not only, it's, it's also about the, the product makeup in those stores. So Four Ways would carry a certain catalog that supports that customer mission. When we open Cedar, understanding the specific mission of that customer, it's going to be more convenient, more prepared, um, more fresh, um, and so it'll be an edited version, um, and we wouldn't necessarily carry the types of items that customers would want to do a trolley shop on. So it, it all it all works together from that point of view. Okay. Now, the, we, we asking, I'm asking this question just to understand um, the, the, the nature of competition as well as uh, what could be the, the geographic market definition um, in, in, in an urban uh, setup like that where you have all these stores uh, not, not very far from each other, in less than 10 k's, less than 5 kilometers in most instances from each other. And um, it's still a difficult point for us to understand from the submissions that have been made, at least in relation where, there's ex the, the, where these explicit lists may still be applicable. I'm not saying it, they are in that s scenario. I'm just making that as an example. But I, th I think in that scenario, to talk about a distance of one kilometer, three kilometers, well, it, 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 it's, it's nonsensical because you, we, we're surprised we open a store in Pretoria, and it's affecting stores in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. uh, how people shop, when we pull our yes. card data, we think people shop just one or two stores. You surprise some card, they shop us at 15 different locations. So you just, you know, it, it is so wide, so variety, so it's, it's you, I don't think you can pull a circle of three kilometers, one kilometer, or 10 kilometers around any environment and saying that's that's the trade trade road. So, so what, what would you suggest we, what would be the, uh, the, the, the uh, especially on this issue of exclusivity, what, what, what would you suggest um, to be the, um, what indicators, what, what should we be looking for to, to influence the geographic market definition and, and, the, and to be the deciding point as to whether certain stores compete with one another or not? Uh, 
so some people will, t will tell us there's already this has been defined already at the tribunal level but just for, we just want to understand from a business point of view because you are the ones who are opening these stores and you know exactly what you're doing you know whether your store is going to be cannibalized by the new store you're opening or not or yeah Madam Chair, in my view, there are so many factors and so complex mm -hmm. that to go down that road is, is not where the answer lies. Mm -hmm. it, it is either either you do away with it or it's time related. It so can't be anything other than it has to be that simple. But okay. you know, but, uh, you know, anything else beyond that is becomes uh, becomes a maze uh, yes. to try and uh, to try and understand yeah, it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you want to? So, Mr. De Villiers, uh, based on what you said, I'd, I'd like to understand what are the what are the more important factors in determining um, whether or not a store competes with another. I mean, uh, you, you just blew our our understanding out of the water of distance, for instance. Uh, you would have seen from our questions that there's uh, references to eight kilometers and the likes, um, but what are the key uh, considerations? Um, you mentioned there's shopper, uh, the shop purpose for one, uh, but well, what would determine whether or not a store is taking away business from the, from another? Mr. Kumaru, the, the market is, is um, it's maybe hard to just choose the right words to answer you. It's very difficult to define the market. It, it is very dynamic, and you can't draw a circle around it and saying that's exactly the market, unless you locate it 400 kilometers away from anything else, and only that households and only those farmers will come into that little town and shop. Then you can define it, accurately calculate the market. When Mall of Africa opened, to see the impact of stores and the breadth and width of stores that's impacted, whether it's all the way from Polokwane to, it, it, it takes away from all over. So a big regional center like that, or whether it's Santa, uh, you know, how far wide it pulls from people coming uh, to shop to shop it. You have uh, farming communities that will drive 400 kilometers just for the day to come and shop Santa or Mall of Africa. So it is very, very difficult to define. So when you come into convenience centers or in neighborhood centers, those <coughs> areas of trade it is probably easier uh, to define, but yet if somebody passing through there, uh, 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 you have an interceptory trade that's still still uh, still happening uh, in, in that space. So I, th I think all stores compete with each other, whether it is a standalone, a CBD store, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different environment, because most of our customers have, have choice whether they shop the CBD of Johannesburg or they s shop in Soweto, or they take a day out to come and shop in Santa. Then it, it's, 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 it's that broad. Mm -hmm. and, and the more we unpack our US car data where we can understand uh, the intelligence around, we can't sometimes communicate with the customer, but we can see these buying patterns of where they shop. We're always amazed at how far and wide what we call sales transfer cannibalization that happens between our stores mm -hmm. uh, and when you open a store. And when the economy goes down, mm -hmm. the cannibalization tend to be higher. When the economy is growing, it tend to hide mm -hmm. some of that cannibalization. So it's, it's, you always see it moves in, in cycles uh, in, in sync with the economy. So, so then what would be the importance of um, adding in your lease agreement as well as that um, a convenience center uh, should not change its purpose to then maybe become a regional if, if it doesn't really matter because you know so so if it if if if, if I as a, as a shopper can go there whether or not it's a regional or uh, convenience uh, you know shopping center why why does it matter to you that it must retain its identity? Yes, uh, Mr. Kwanu, if we can go back to the previous example of Four Ways. Four Ways' purpose is to be a dominant regional fashion destination. That's what it is. 
So we're going to Four Ways as the destination for that particular trade note. And we built a big, beautiful store, all our fashion components in there. That's what it's supposed to do, uh, the role that it's supposed to fulfill. That's what we sign up for up front before we make the decision. Up comes Cedar, uh, right, just across the road, just happened to be owned by the same owner. We say to them that is about convenience, it's about how you get in, how do you park, what do you pay for parking tariffs, whether it's free, because that purpose is about intercepting the home where we'll sign up as a convenience centre, but we don't want you to change the nature uh, of, uh, of it and start with national fashion in that centre, and now you're trying to take away from, from, from four ways. That's not what we're signing up for. If that's your intention, please disclose it up front, because then we can factor it into our decision making as to whether we participate or don't participate. So the purpose of those clauses is really just to hold them true to the intent that they sold us and what we sold onto our board when they granted us the right to go to go ahead with the deal. Okay, so, so, so if the owner uh, realizes that, uh, you know, for some reason or another, um, the convenience store is no longer, you know, making business sense and the market demands that he expands it, um, how difficult or easy is it for for that uh, for that owner of that uh, uh, shopping center to to change its its identity? I just just, just, to, sorry, sorry, yeah, sure. just to add to that, is it possible that the owner can come to a view that um, to this view, and yet Woolies, Woolworth is still happy with the old model? Can that, is, is that possible in this kind of situation? So, uh, can your can can the benefits of having a convenience center like City Square um, change over time for the developer and yet uh, remain the, the same for Woolworths because you're still happy with that convenience shopper who's still passing by? And, and why would that be? Well, just to add to the question that you're being asked. I think you need to take factor, uh, Mr. Kamalu, the size of the centine. So Cedar is quite large, it's over 20,000 square. So typically when somebody comes to over 20,000 square, you know that he needs to put in more than just the normal convenient play of restaurants. He needs it's an element of fashion, and, and that's fine, and we're not, we're not objecting to it. What we're obje objecting to is, is, is that if you have the big national fashion brands mm. in the regional mall and he has vacancies and a way for him to fill his vacancies is to try and get a national fashion into that center. Mm. That we're saying to him is, you know, that's not the purpose. If it's any convenient related tenant or entertainment tenant, please go ahead. If you want to extend the center, extend the center. So we're not objecting to it. It's, it's only when you come to, in this, when you sit in the shadow of a big regional mall and you have big fashion uh, brands in that take up big space and now you want to duplicate it in your centre right across the road. Mm. That we're saying, you know, that, that's not what we sign up for. Or that you disclose up front. So based on that, could, could I conclude that uh, two regional centres within uh, kilometer. Uh, yeah, a kilometre or five kilometres from each other um, do compete? I, I think they do compete. It, it just, you know, it's, it's, we don't want to fragment the market further. It's really, uh, and, and, um, from a food point of view, you, you, you automatically fragment the market when you sign up into Cedar next to Four Ways. That, that is, but it's to capture the different purpose of, of, of shopping. Is your concern that, um, would you either would you lose that convenience shopper, or I'm trying to understand what your concern is? Is it yeah? Is it, is it losing that convenience shopper in Cedar Square, or is it that? <coughs> but uh, uh, maybe to add also is we don't want you know, yeah, that put the parking um, into structure parking that goes into paid parking. You know that, mm. that so it's more the on cost of how the center is going to impact on, on the convenience aspect of that center, and that made it, and that was the original attraction of the center. Okay, of sure. why, why we, as uh, the customers were to go there, the food shoppers were to go there. Okay. Um, the, 
there's a question coming from uh, one of my colleagues as to uh, on the issue of uh, defining a ge the geographic market in the, within the context of um, um, uh, these shopping centers and the fact that you find um, you, you, where, in a case where you find them, let, let's say, in that four-way situation. Um, and then the question is, could the catchment area be the, the, the decisive or, de or defining point here? The catchment area for each store, you, or wouldn't these be overlapping anyway? Wouldn't they be, like, what, what would your view be? Are you referring to the food trade? Food trade, yes. yes. Yeah, the catchment areas in that in that example will always over, over, uh, overlay, uh, over, overlap. Hugely so. Yeah, hugely okay. so. So, so for me, if, um, you would have seen we have some questions around uh, tenant mixed laws. Um, do you know? Do they do do they matter uh, on the base uh, based on the on the type of um, center that that you are in? For instance, um, I, it's starting to be clearer to me for mm -hmm. where you want to keep a convenience store to be the same. But we have tenant mixed laws in the original center. The tenant mix clauses for a regional mall will take away, again, uh, uh, four ways. Mm. The, the size of store to, uh, that we put in is a function of the size of the market, how big the center they're going to develop, and also how big all the other competitors is. So what the tenant clauses are there is to capture what the landlord present to us. So he's saying to us, take 10,000 squares in, 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 in four ways mall, I've got all these other big boxes that's coming in. This is where they're positioned in the center, and the tenant clauses are there to capture them as that's your intent. They're going to be of that size. And if they're not there of that size, then you need to replace them with a similar or equivalent tenant of, of, of that nature because our investment decisions are based on the power of what that center is. And some for four ways to be powerful, dominant, uh, in its area, it needs to have a certain level of gravitas uh, that, that comes with it. And, and that's what the purpose of those clauses are, is to intend to capture what the landlord said he is due to deliver and uh, on what we factored in, in making our investment decision. Okay. So, um, if, say, we, all, we come to an agreement at the end of the inquiry with the other food retailers uh, um, that no more exclusive leases, um, can a, can a tenant mixed laws not use, be used uh, to serve the same purpose? I, you know, um, at the beginning, I as you know, Kumalo P2I Limited, I'm one of the big four. I'm saying, right, uh, Mr. Landlord, this is what you are saying you're going to have as tenants, right? Um, and they are going to be located here, and this their size. And now. Uh, Woolworths wants to come with, with a food offering, and I'm saying that's not what you said in the beginning. Can't that be used in a similar way? I, I, I can't speak for my competitors' leases or it's written. In the case of our leases, it's saying these, <coughs> these are the major anchors that you specify, and they are critical to the size of our investment. It doesn't capture the whole, all the tenants in the center at all. Uh, and, and if they're not there, you need to replace them with a similar equivalent uh, uh, food anchor. So whether it's a pick and pay there and tomorrow it's a checkers, it's neither here, it's a similar equivalent to us. You need a big food anchor on that side of the mall to ensure that the mall is sustained. I think, as Mr. Kumala asked your question, I think it goes to the degree of how you specify that clause and whether, the, yes, there's potential risk that it can go there, but it's, it's a function of how that, that clause reads at the end of the day. In our cases, it doesn't read like it. It, it deals saying these are the material tenants in the centre uh, that, that is critical for us to trade there. And if they are not there, then it gives us the right to break the lease and go or elect to stay on if we so wish. So the mechanism there is really about not preventing somebody in. It gives us the flexibility to be able to exit uh, the centre and not having to trade for the full period while there's a big vacancy in the centre and, uh, and it's not trading. Uh, in, in a new development, does uh, Woolworths, uh, w 
where you invited as, a, as one of the Inca tenants, do, do you prescribe to the landlord as to where they must uh, locate the rest of the tenants um, in, the, in, 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 in a development? I would say we, we don't prescribe. They come to us with a concept. Mm -hmm. So on a big regional mall, like Four Ways or any other mall, they will show the layout. We would comment about the, the, the tenancies that surround us or near us. Is it complementary to us? Okay. So it, it does not make sense to have a low LSM tenant next to us when we try to build a high LSM. So okay. they either they group them in the tenancies, the adjacencies of the tenants. So the landlord would come and present. And most of the large landlords normally would do that automatically up front when they place the tenancies in the various centres. So our focus is mainly is who is your main anchors, where are we positioned, and how does the flow work, and is our, our side of the centre, because we fulfil an anchor role, is, is it going to be quiet? You know, are we sitting in the dead end of the centre? What else are you putting a, a coffee shop in nearby, and are you putting some exciting tenants that can create excitement for people to come to the side of the mall? And is the mall balanced in terms of flow of foot traffic? That's what we will typically look at. questions from our side. Um, if you can just maybe help us to understand how it works when there's a new property development. So if, would Woolworths be the, the, the firm that approaches the property developer or landlord to say, I see you are developing a new mall, we think we would want to take up space there, or will you always be first approached by a landlord with something and he will put something on the table for, for you to consider? I think by far the majority, over 90% of the times we are approached. Um, in some small convenience centre cases, we might see a good site or the suburb is expanding uh, and identify and seeing, okay, but the centre looks interesting. Maybe there's enough of a market there for us now to go and open a store and we will go and knock, go and knock on their door, uh, on the land, on the owner's door. And I also just wanted to ask you about the different components that make up the rental that you pay per square meter in a shopping centre or more. If you could maybe just help us to understand the different components. So we understand um, from previous submissions there's something called the base rental and yep. the turnover rental. Um, how are these components calculated and are there any other components of the rental that you pay that we should be aware of? I think, firstly, uh, uh, Ms. Grunbrink, we I think we're quite, we're quite unique in the market uh, as to how our rental deal is structured, and it's been like that for uh, uh, for many, many, many years. So typically, we would pay uh, 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 what we classify a basic rent, uh, non-escalating, uh, uh, over the duration of the lease period. So, by example. Uh, choose a number, say 100 rand a square meter, and the 100 rand a square meter will not escalate for the full 10 years period of a, of a typical food store. What happens thereafter is that the end of year one, the turnover becomes what we call the threshold turnover. So after year one, the growth in turnover, we would pay between year two and one, and three and one, and five and one, meaning so after year one, we do a turnover of say 200 rand, in year two, we do a turnover of 400 rand. That difference between the two would attract turnover rental. And so the turnover rental, the purpose of the structure of, of this uh, deal is that we are basically partners because if you're not looking after the center or you charge too much for the parking or it's not convenient or it's not well tenanted, our turnover will suffer and hence your turnover rental will go backwards. So the whole purpose of the design of that uh, rental structure is, is that, that uh, we ensure that the landlord can't just demand a fixed escalation every year and, and not maintain the centre and basically walk away from his investment. Um, uh, so, so we pay a basic non-escalating and a turnover component that, that gets calculated at the end of each year relative to what the base <coughs> turnover was. The, we pay all our consum metered consumption charges, so we pay for electricity, we pay for water, uh, uh, and in some cases uh, 
we would buy a, if we on the centers air conditioning, we would buy a percentage of the air con uh, centers air conditioning cost. But in most cases, we have our own dedicated air conditioning uh, systems. That, in by large, is 90% of what we pay for. In some cases, in the regional malls, there might be a contribution to, towards marketing funds, but that's about it. Yeah. And some of the very old historic leases, there might be a contribution towards common area charges, but uh, they are really in the in, in, in a minimum uh, in our case. Okay. Then a final question from my side. Um, we understand <coughs> that anchor tenants in a in a shopping mall or centre will pay a lower rental per square meter than other line tenants or you know your smaller um, independent uh, stores. If you could maybe just uh, try to help us understand the rationale for this. So why would you know a small store of I don't know 50 square meters pay a higher rate per square meter than a, a, a store of a 3,000 square meter um, size for for argument's sake? I think the simplest way to put it, it's demand and supply. Uh, you know, it's an international trend. Uh, it's not unique to South Africa uh, in, in the Western world and in Europe. It's exactly the same same concept. The developer needs the anchor tenant who's going to pull the feet. Uh, um, the small line store is not necessarily going to draw the feet to the center. They're complementary to the center, and they need the anchor to survive. So if we don't pull the feet into the mall, that's why we sit at the far end of the mall, in the deep spaces in the mall, in order to pull the feet past the small line store. His success is dependent <coughs> on, on our ability and our other big anch uh, the anchors in, in the South African market to draw feet into the center. Uh, and if they do it successfully, then everyone trades well. And hence, I think they, pay, they will pay a different rental, uh, rental structure. mentioned something like uh, common area charges. Can, can you can clarify what that is? Uh, Mr. Kamali, uh, common area charges might be uh, the, the landlord would calculate the, um, the electricity for the malls, the air condition for the malls, the, um, the cleaning of, his, of the center toilets, the security to the center, which is a charge that he cannot, you know, it has global charges, and then, then each of the tenants would pay a percentage of that total bill. Uh, normally, typically, is what is the, that ratio of the store size relative to the centre size. Uh, and, and the landlord would try and recover his cost that way. And so if you represent 2% of the footprint in the centre, you'll pick up 2% of that component of the bill. Uh, and uh, on top of that, do you still pay your individual um, electricity and water. Yes, yes, we do. And, 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 and all the retailers are just happy to do that. No, it's it's a point of negotiation. Uh, you know, uh, from us, is, it is uh, we try to negotiate those things out and not not enter into those kind of arrangement because you have no control over it. You know, whether he's managing it efficiently or not efficiently. Uh, so, you know, we ventured into all our own refuge removal as far as we can possibly and not make use of the center's refuge removal because we can control the cost better. Um, just my last question. Uh, I tried to understand the, uh, just to link up to the question that was asked by my colleague on the, on the rent, on the discount that is afforded to an anchor tenant. Um, on the rental paid by the anchor tenant, and basically wanting to know if is it possible at all, or is it ridiculous to even suggest it or think of it, that there could there could be a clearly identified percentage when parties negotiate if they bring Woolworths as a, as a second anchor tenant, and it, and you're getting a discount uh, because you are a second te te uh, anchor tenant and um, in, in that mall and therefore you're going to be getting a discount. Is it possible to apportion uh, a, a, a percentage to as a component of that rental so that it becomes clearer to anyone who's looking at these leases as to why so much discounts are given to uh, bigger retailers and so much, and, 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 then, and, 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 and this big difference between a smaller player and a bigger player? 
because this is a complaint that we are um, uh, um, faced with as inquiry from the smaller retailers and shopping centers in general, not just in the food sector, but all the all the players in the shopping centers are complaining about the rentals that they're having to play, pay compared to those that are paid by your by bigger retailers. Probably uh, Woolers would be included in that um, category of bigger bigger retailers. I think if we want to take just one step back before we on is the issue about discountable leases. So the developer needs uh, blue chip tenants with long leases in order to raise capital in order to develop the scheme, which is basically what the banks would have would have shared with you. Uh, and they, the banks do not take into account the small little retailer uh, and and do not lend against uh, our understanding of it against those small retailers. So the, the, the developer, and to kickstart the scheme, needs the, uh, the blue chip tenants leases as far as, uh, as possible, and normally that makes up a big a big component. Mm -hmm. To answer your question as to, and that's, you know, because they need us up front, then it's a point of demand and supply. Do, do we want to go into the center, the landlord desperately needs us, then the rental is very attractive. Or we want desperately to come in, we end up paying, uh, paying a, a, a lot more. As to the discount between, in our view, it's not a discount. Mm -hmm. you, you know, uh, the small guy saying there's a discount, we see it not as a discount, it's a what can we afford to pay in order to make that investment pay for us relative to the risk that we're taking. <coughs> the, it's the, exactly the same for the, for the small guy. He's going to do certain turnover. It's, it's the same as renting a house. I mean, you can rent an expensive house, you can rent a cheap house. Now, to say I'm renting an expensive house, now I'm complaining because I, I, you know, I'm paying too much rent. It is about the decision you take up front about the viability of the investment decision you're about to take. And it's, it's driven by demand and supply. Yeah, but the difference here being that... Uh, the difference here being that um, we, we're just trying to understand if, for example, you had to look at... Um, Let's make an example of example of Centen. Um, if you look at Centen as a shopping center, so you want to uh, what, what would is there a base um, figure, base amount of uh, of what the rental is there, and therefore let's say if, if you've got a smaller player that's paying 150 rents, and and there's a there's a, a, a Woolworths and Woolworths is paying 50 rents. Can we take it that you've been given a two-thirds discount to the rental? So what would be the price of the rental? What's the price of the rental in that in, in that shopping center? Uh, or is it a, it, does it become commoditized in a sense that it's, it's about how, what you're able to negotiate and what you're not able to negotiate as a, as a player? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I wish we could pay those kind of rents in St. and we would love to. Per square meter, per square, per square meter. meter. No, no, I understand. Just. Mm. Firstly, the line stores, we sign up for 10 years and we lock into a rental agreement over a period of time. The small line stores sign up for three years. Mm -hmm. So his rent levels are very different. If there's lots of vacancies, the, the rent will be much lower. If there's mm -hmm. a big demand and they have a long list of tenants that want to come in, the rent will be, can go up to 1,000 rands <coughs> we needed for, for the claim, small tenant. So you're trying to compare and take a snapshot now yeah. of what somebody pays per square meter relative to us who signed the deal 20 years ago. Yeah. in trying to compare the two agreements. It's, it's not... Uh, it's not yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much. We have no further questions. And uh, thank you very much for your submission. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair.